Welcome to the Art of Procurement podcast. I'm Philip Eidson, a 20-year procurement practitioner, former head of procurement, advisor to procurement leaders around the world, and the founder and managing director of Art of Procurement. My team and I work with our global network of subject matter experts to help companies elevate procurement impact whether that's through building and implementing transformation programs, sustainably reducing external expenses, or leveraging AOP Mastermind, our learning and development platform for companies of all sizes. You're listening to our flagship podcast, where we pull back the curtain and shine a light on the strategies, tactics, and tools that leading procurement teams are using to align their results with the needs of the business. everybody and welcome to this week's Art of Procurement podcast and today on the show I'm joined by Jürgen Schirer. Jürgen has a wonderfully diverse background as you're going to hear today in the show. He's held executive leadership roles across procurement, supply chain, sales and operations and his doctoral thesis on procurement marketing received the scientific award of the German Industry Association for Purchasing and Supplier Management. Today, Jürgen splits his time between Germany and the U.S. West Coast as a business consultant and a coach, leading his business called BXB Exchange. Now, I got to know Jürgen following the podcast that I published a couple of months ago, episodes 329 and 330, that explored the flywheel effect and its applicability to procurement. This was a topic that resonated with Jürgen based on his background leading teams both inside and outside of procurement, and so I invited him on the show today to hear his perspectives on building procurement teams that meet business needs. Now before I roll the tape, I want to remind you that there are only a few days to go to register for your free ticket to join us at AOP Mastermind Live on October the 6th and 7th. Over the course of six hours, we're going to be combining keynote sessions, workshops, and Q&As with a series of subject matter experts from inside and outside of the procurement industry to really help us explore how procurement leaders can take action today. And that's really important. It's going to be based on taking actions. It's action-oriented to turn the spotlight that is shining upon us in this pandemic into becoming long-term trusted advisors. So if you want to have a more impactful role for procurement, then this is definitely the event for you. Now, in one of the sessions, I'm going to be chatting with Daniel Stum. And Daniel is the CPO of Indirect Procurement at ABB, where he oversees more than $3 billion in annual indirect spend. In our session, we're going to be talking about ABB's journey to transform indirect procurement, where they have had to take a really pragmatic approach to elevating their impact. We'll also discuss how to build a business case to fund procurement transformation in an organization that has competing investment priorities. To register for free for all of our sessions at Mastermind Live, just go to artofprocurement.com slash mastermindlive. That's artofprocurement.com slash mastermindlive. All right, then, well, let's go straight into my conversation then with Jürgen, where I start by asking him if he found procurement or if procurement found him. Yeah, that's... Uh... That's a very good question. Um, I have listened to to various um, podcasts with uh, with many people from from different areas, and I find it always interesting that I guess the majority um, ends or spends time in procurement, not necessarily by by choice. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've listened to a, quite a few people who who were very surprised uh, to join the procurement function at, at a certain point. This has been quite different in, in my case. It was uh, pretty intentionally. Uh, the background is, is um, straightforward. I, I studied in Cologne at Cologne University in, in Germany. And at the time where I did my MBA, uh, there was already um, a major you could specialize in, in procurement. As a matter of fact, um, it was the first chair at the university in Germany at the time of specializing on procurement, calling it procurement marketing. Mm-hmm. And, um, we might come back to that 
term uh, throughout our conversation, uh, a term which which I think never made it really uh, to the U.S., but uh, the idea pretty much is what you do to the sell side, uh, you do equally to the buy side. So procurement marketing, upstream marketing, uh, there is a pretty well-known publication called reverse marketing, basically all the same the same concept um, to define what you need for your own organization through the interaction mm -hmm. with the markets, whether it's the south side or the buy side. And, and I really enjoyed this. And I wanted to continue um, doing also my, my PhD as an external PhD student while at the same time getting working experience in this area. So I, I intentionally looked for large corporations, global corporations offering um, a program in logistics and procurement. And I was very fortunate that Henkel, a uh, fast-moving consumer good company based in, in Düsseldorf in Germany at the time, um, kicked off a pretty intensive program, a job rotation program. I was one of the very first four to join. Um, at the same time, I did my PhD in the field of procurement marketing. Um, and I ended up being 12 years with Henkel in logistics and, and purchasing among uh, those 12. I was also two and a half years in, in the U.S. So it was a very deliberate choice. And, and I can only say, uh, looking back to that time, I... I really enjoyed it, um, and I would I would do it exactly mm -hmm. the same way again. N now you um, you've had a really varied background, both um, geographically, but also from a functional perspective, and uh, you know, kind of moved into sales, business unit leadership roles, and those are quite unusual for somebody with a um, you know a background in procurement. Oftentimes we when you begin in procurement, you end up staying in procurement. You know, that's kind of what happened to me, even though I've tried to get as varied a view as possible. Um, what were some of the motivations to then kind of move on and, and open into different parts of the organization? Um, and how did that inform some of your thinking then about procurement? Yeah. Um, again, it, it goes partly back to the time at the university besides majoring in procurement i also had a major uh, focus on marketing and sales alongside with uh, what was called organizational social psychology so i always found the market the market interaction personally the most exciting field to work in and Therefore, it was kind of kind of natural yeah. uh, that my interest was was buy side and sell side. And again, uh, circumstances, maybe a little bit of luck, whatever you want to call it, being at at the at the right point in time, at the right place. I was while I was in the U.S. for for Henkel um, in the corporate purchasing organization. I was asked. Um, by one of the, the board members at Henkel, whether I would be interested to leave the procurement function and join the industrial marketing and sales part of what is nowadays the adhesive division in, in Henkel. And um, I mean, we are not very often asked by a board member right. at that young um, point in your career, so I, I did not have to, to think much about it. Unfortunately, it brought me from Philadelphia to Detroit, and, um, and that was location-wise maybe um, a little rougher environment, but mm -hmm. I spent 15 months in industrial marketing in, in Detroit, and um, and that was an eye-opener an eye opener because I traveled um, with the salespeople, I supported the salespeople um, throughout the entire country. I was on the road every every week, and and probably the most the most decisive experience I had in in that time uh, was with the automotive industry. Henkel um, supplied the automotive automotive industry and and still does today uh, to a very large extent. One of their product lines is is actually a, a chemical bath. The car bodies are going through because 
before they go into the, the paint shop. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the big three, um, uh, General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, at the time, beginning of the 90s, all decided we don't want to deal with this anymore from a purchasing perspective and even from a, from a manufacturing perspective. So they outsourced the entire line to suppliers and Henkel became a core strategic supplier managing this part of the production. So we Henkel people were in the factory Mm -hmm. of the the big three managing this line. And and the, the most striking factor was you had to teach your entire organization that it's no longer important to sell as much as possible volume wise but now as little as possible because we were paid by the treated unit at the end of the day so we had to optimize basically mm-hmm. the entire flow and and that was an eye opener in in many ways for uh, for myself and it and it continuously sparked my interest eventually to move to the sell side of the of the marketing function and and that happened and then a couple of years later um henkel decided to sell off their chemical division so a classical b2b business the company uh, got bought out by private equity was actually held for for 10 years uh, by private equity owners before they eventually sold the business to BASF. And I was then for for 12 years with the chemical division of Henkel, which became a, an independent company called Cognos and became responsible for uh, corporate key account management and sales on a, on a global basis. So I went exactly to the other side Right, the other side of the table, as it's always always referred to, and um, and benefited tremendously from my experience um, on on the purchasing and procurement side, but also learned um, many many things in working with the purchasing and procurement side of our customers. So the big customers were the big home and personal care companies. Um, Procter, Unilever, Colgate, mm-hmm. L'Oreal, uh, Henkel still. Um, and many of them had very, very um, far advanced procurement organizations. So serving them, selling to them, uh, managing the key account organization and matching that with their procurement organization uh, was a was a really exciting exciting time and again uh, the the benefits from from having been on on the procurement side helped a lot uh, to manage to manage throughout those years so so as you engaged in the with the client's procurement um side kind of folks that you were working with what are some of the things you said that you um um were really you had a lot of good experiences uh, you know working with the procurement teams for some of those lag organizations i love if you could just share perhaps some examples of what it was that they were doing differently or what are the things some of the things they were doing that were helping you as a supplier you know while obviously still being um carrying out their duties and their responsibilities and meeting their objectives for their own businesses yeah i would i would probably recall two two particular examples as as best in class based on the experiences we had it it was the time um, also where um, open innovation um, started truly between um, companies like like those mentioned mm-hmm. and their suppliers and, and you might recall AG Lefley was the uh, the CEO of of Procter and Gamble yeah. at the time uh, he he was pushing the organization to get to fifty percent of innovation being um, come or coming from the outside and no longer from within cultural major cultural change in 
in, in such a large organization and coming obviously from suppliers, but also from startups, from um, connections through associations, universities, um, and, 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 and we were in a particular situation um, when we, when I started with, with, with Cognis on the sales side, we, we had literally zero business with Procter and Gamble background. Uh, pretty simple. Procter, a major competitor of Henkel. Cognis was the chemical division of Henkel. Mm-hmm. So until Cognis became an independent company, uh, Procter had no interest and would avoid to, to work with uh, with the chemical division of Henkel. Now, when, when we got an independent company, they started to get interested to us. And, and long story short, uh, six, seven years later, um, we had three digit million business mm-hmm. with Procter and Gamble. And that journey was an, a, a tremendous journey. And, and Procter was the, uh, the company who, who truly, um, had a, at that time already a supplier development program in place and would not only call it that way, but truly execute it. So you started going a little bit into the details. You started with what is sometimes referred to as bloody commodity business. So <laughs> right. you have to show them that you are competitive uh, with with products which are uh, certainly not unique, which are mass products, large volumes, so a lot of spend you, you're gonna you're gonna manage for them. But they wanted to see whether you are capable on a large scale to serve them around the world in various locations, large volumes, short call offs. So the first two three years when we started, we were only given those big chunks of meat basically to chew on and to prove. To them that we are capable of managing it in, in 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 a global global environment and once this was passed and that was clearly clearly communicated from the beginning so expectation management yeah. from their side was was very very clear to say if you guys want to have a major position you want to become a strategic supplier to us you need to go through that process. And and we had a long discussion internally whether we can do it and, and whether we have the breath of doing it, but we decided to go for it. Second phase, you would start selling specialties, so products which were probably a little bit more unique, which not everyone could offer, where you had a little bit more of margin and yeah. therefore fun yeah. uh, in, in selling it. But the ultimate goal and and that is what we reached at the end before the company actually was, as I mentioned, um, taken over by by BSF was the real innovative um, products. And those were exclusive products you would develop with them, with R&D people on their side, uh, with technical people on our side, really making a difference sometimes um, very low volume, but high impact in cosmetic application, mm-hmm. skincare products, for example. So it was a, a, a really interesting journey. And, and as I said, um, it was um, very clear in terms of expectations. Um, it was always tough. Um, it was n- never an easy journey, but it was at the same time, very fair and and i think that's one of the the key learnings i would i would apply to any supplier customer seller buyer relationship um it goes through ups and downs but the 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 decisive factor is that first of all you need to align the expectations up front you have to ensure that you stick to what you have been telling to each other and that cuts both ways and thirdly, if things go wrong, you have to have an open dialogue to get it fixed and, and not start yelling at each other and, and making the other party responsible for it. So it, it, it was truly a, an interesting journey. And to add to that, maybe um, different culture, uh, or not maybe different culture, very much a different culture, uh, Johnson & Johnson. Um, 
as they call themselves, the family of companies. Mm -hmm. and, and that is already giving you a, an indication, a much more softer approach. Um, we worked with the consumer product side of Johnson & Johnson, so not, not with the, the pharmaceutical end. Um, and, and we developed, basically, Cognos developed with Johnson & Johnson a product category which did not exist until both companies worked together, the category of wet wipes. Mm -hmm. So uh, we all know today these kind of convenience products, yeah. whether you use them for your, for your babies and toddlers, whether you clean your dashboard with it, your kitchen counter, whatever it is. But the problem at the time was um, that no one had the technology to keep the tissues moist in the packaging over the usage of the product. So whenever um, that was dried prior the, and you opened the pack, the product, the wipes would dry out mm -hmm. very quickly. And, and Cognos had a technology which was actually meant for a different application, but found out incorporating openly cooperating with uh, Johnson & Johnson, that that would potentially work. And it was a development project of, of a couple of years. Um, we had joint uh, technicians working alongside in the same lab. Johnson & Johnson sent people over to Cognos for, for months working with us in our labs. We worked with them uh, together. Um, it was even more of a challenge because the manufacturing of that was outsourced to a, a third party. So it was tr truly a triangle yeah. uh, w we had to manage. But, but the success at the end of the day was um, a, a very profitable new business, which we generated for both companies. And, um, and again, the, the procurement organization, the purchasing organization of Johnson & Johnson, had a major, a major um, impact on that. And, and I would summarize maybe the two examples with the fact that both, both organizations truly understood Procter and Johnson and Johnson procurement that besides doing your operational day to day job with your suppliers, you need to have resources dedicated to develop suppliers as well. And, and to lead them, to guide them, to help them, to open doors, mm -hmm. to get to marketing. So these kind of discussions are needed and, and are an essential role of a, of a procurement or purchasing organization um, to, to really show impact um, internally. Now, now, those couple of examples, um, I just had a couple of questions related to the innovation side of things. So... Um, would you, so how transparent were all the organizations? So, you know, everybody, when you have, um, you're pursuing product, you know, new product innovation like that, you're actually creating a new, uh, category, as you said, with Johnson and Johnson, is it, are all cards on the table? Um, or are you still doing it kind of with that protective shield of your will of what your commercials are, what their commercials are? Um, and you're just trying to at least figure out how we get to a place where it's uh, there's something in it for both of us. Yeah, this certainly could be a, a, a topic in itself uh, for for a much more in depth discussion. And I would say it, of course, depends um, from customer supplier relationship to the next. None, none of those are equal mm -hmm. and, and yeah. circumstances and preconditions and scope um, are let, um, defining how, how the process works. But to, to get back to your, to your question, I think it is, and it has been in both cases I'm, I'm referring to, um, certainly a journey of continuous trust building. Yeah. And um, obviously, when I go back to the Procter example, trust was very little at the beginning. We didn't know each other. 
Johnson and Johnson have been a different story. They have been a relationship for a while, um, but it doesn't matter. You you start working, and each and every step is a trust building step, or is a step backwards. And and those are more more decisive than the trust building ones because there's a tendency as as soon as something goes wrong that there is a finger pointing and and there is more than just a little step back it's it's much farther there is um there is coverage of intellectual property there's no question Mm -hmm. about it and there has to be um on both ends so you you get lawyers involved you you get your your r d specialists involved but again um as i mentioned before managing the expectations setting the expectations openly is is vital and i give you one example in in the case of of j and j with with wet wipes we were very clear with them that we would be willing to give them exclusivity on this technology which would allow the product to market and successfully market but only for a limited time mm-hmm. because it was clear to us if if the product takes off we want to develop business with competition yeah. of of Johnson and Johnson. Yeah. So we we had to ensure that they were satisfied with the kind of advantage of of first market mover and and bringing it early to the market and and really developing the the category. Um, but at the same time, they had to accept and had to grant to us that we would want to do. Uh, market development beyond that, and and that worked out well. A lot of discussions, obviously, a lot of back and forth, but I think um, again, it it needs to be addressed up front, so so you don't get surprised and disappointed either way, right. either side, mm-hmm. at a later stage in in the development. Yeah, and, and the other thing, just to to pull out there, which you mentioned a number of times, is actually doing what you say you're going to do. Um, and that's something that, yeah. um, you know, certainly I've had experience, you know, building these supply development programs and then think about in the automotive space, um, which, you know, you mentioned before, I've been on that side of the table in that environment. And once things start to go through a rough patch, you know, one of the first things that goes is those commitments that were made to, um, you know, everything's good during the good times, but as soon as you get into hard times, um, you, you you come knocking back at the door asking for cost reductions, and that's not necessarily in spirit of the commitments, but also it just destroys the trust that you talked about. Um, the other thing that I really wanted to um, dig into a little bit today about your background is, um, you know, as you moved then into um, sales and business uh, leadership roles. Um, obviously, selling value propositions became, you know, your key job. You're selling, whether it's from a product perspective or service perspective. Um, y- you were obviously involved heavily in doing that. Um, you know, one of the ways that we connected was around selling the procurement value proposition. Um, and so, what are some of the things that you know, having had experience now on both sides, that we could be doing as procurement leaders to be more effective in? Um, selling the value selling the role of procurement interesting interesting topic and and i would i i would start um probably with the question what is the usp Mm -hmm. of the procurement function what what is the the unique selling proposition you want to you want to market and um i i have i've read recently in a very interesting paper. It's actually a summary of a discussion among um, leading researchers in North America and in Europe on, on procurement or procurement and, and supply management. And the article has been published. Um, the, the lead author is Lisa Elram, who has done a lot of a lot of work um, in in the procurement area, and and, and in that discussion, it's basically a, a, a notes and debates paper. Um, they jointly came up with what I could not agree more with that the the true USP of of this function is to link the upstream side, the supply side, the resources 
with the internal side with your stakeholders, mm -hmm. whether it's design, whether it's engineering, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's marketing, in order to generate value, to mitigate risk, to cut cost or to optimize cost, um, as, as we all know, as, as the main target. So it's, it's this, this role which they define and, and there is new research on this as truly being ambidextrous. So the, the role of this function is to link the, the two sides, the supply market and the internal stakeholders for optimization. And that is, again, back to the beginning of our discussion, nothing else than what sales is doing mm -hmm. on the sales side marketing end. So in, in almost the mirror image, it's the same kind of USP you try to generate with your customers is what you try to generate with your suppliers. So in this Ambidextrous role, they are talking about boundary spanning, which, which truly uh, illustrates that they're talking about bridge building, which is another nice picture of illustrating how this, this, this role works. And, and I would say, um, unless the organization is, is really, the procurement organization is really set to do exactly this as, as the main focus, it is extremely difficult um, to become an equally recognized internal business partner or whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it. The reality is, unfortunately, that too many, in my, my opinion, too many procurement organizations have not the true focus on this boundary spanning bridge building role, but go rather functionally very deep down. There, there has been another term for that. I think it was, was, uh, Bruce Allen or, um, someone in the consulting uh, space who called that the rabbit hole, um, yeah. of the procurement function. And, and I find that picture very, very much true. Um, I, I, I've seen too many procurement organizations being caught in that hole, sometimes even further pushed in that hole with the wrong incentives, with, with, with the wrong targets, um, or with the wrong focus of the targets, um, and, and not being really positioned in a way that they can take this, this boundary spanning, linking um, role between the external and the internal world uh, as as the main the main target. So, back to your question, I think if you if you really position yourself as this strong link, then the question of whether you are internally well recognized and if your internal stakeholders want to work with you dissolves because mm -hmm. they will they see that you bring value that you bring innovation that you bring cost optimization whatever it might be and and the rest just goes without without saying but you need first to do your homework and and to manage the external sources and and to find the right counterparts for those resources in in your own organization before that that really takes off now do you find that that's kind of a mindset shift is it's it comes from within procurement to start with it's unlikely that you'll have a business executive come to procurement and define like this is what i need from you it's more procurement um kind of building that value proposition and maybe doing it on a small basis to start with uh, much like the example that you gave earlier uh, with procter and gamble kind of starting small um, but demonstrating the potential of procurement and then getting the buy-in to go and scale that. Yeah, um, it, it certainly has to have um, a, a very strong drive from within, but um, I, I would also argue that wherever you have um, a business leader 
it might be the CEO, it might be uh, someone who is who is leading um, the the functional area. I mean, this is the the, the very often debated discussion: where, where should the CPO report mm-hmm. to? It it can be, in principle, it can be. Uh, the CFO, it, it can be a COO. I would always argue the likelihood is is much bigger if it if it's probably a CEO or CMO, uh, a business unit leader, someone who who basically gives that entire function a, a new visionary target to to work against, and and that might be a. Um, a, a good segue to to what I like to refer to um, often when when I'm discussing this this with um, different people, um, and and I know that that you have looked into this and and have recently also um, issued a couple of really nice nice um, white papers around the work of of Jim Collins. Mm-hmm. Jim Collins, good to great um, research twenty years ago. Uh, what what makes great companies, um, and, and how do they differentiate from from really good companies? And he came up across industries and and uh, across many different geographies with with five or six key points, which I would think can be very well applied to what needs to be done on the procurement side from a functional perspective. And back to our discussion just a minute ago, the very first point is what he calls level five leadership. This is someone who is absolutely passionate and visionary and has a different mindset in driving this organization. And, and I, I like to to circle back to the beginning of, of um, our conversation. When I joined Henkel um, in uh, the very beginning of my career, we had two visionary people who became the, the group vice president of logistics, in, including procurement. And both of them, um, came from the marketing and sales side. And they looked into the procurement function and recognized exactly the lack of this external bridging, boundary spanning role, which which was not existent. Mm-hmm. And they immediately started to turn that around. And, and often we, we talk about strategic transformation of the procurement function. I would argue that's what... A, strategic transformation has has to start with. And, and if we follow through um, the three, four other steps of, of Collins, they, they apply um, equally because the next step is, is, is basically you need to get the right people before you can develop the strategy. Mm-hmm. So um, in, in more casual terms, he calls it get the right people on the bus, get the wrong people off the bus. That's sometimes a, a tough tough thing to do, but the reality is, unless you have a larger team built, which can then further develop and deploy the strategy you want to implement, it's not it's not going to work. Um, it's, it's not going to work if you just change two or three people. To give you an example, in, in that Henkel program, which I joined, uh, we hired uh, more than 50 people over the course of five, six years in order to change that organization around. Um, number three is confront with brutal facts. Uh, that's what, what Collins um, says. So you, you, you need to face reality and, yeah. and stop doing things which, 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 uh, which truly do not make sense and, and are not, um, not helping you to develop the function. Number four is to uh, focus on what you can do best. Mm -hmm. And that means uh, you might need to give up what you can't do best. You cannot do everything. Um, That's the reality. So that might lead to, um, from a functional perspective, 
um, not sourcing each and every product category on your own, but finding coalitions, finding yeah. potentially other partners who can do it, outsource it potentially. And then obviously a culture of, of disciplined implementation o- over time. And, and those follow those five steps. I think that's what you, what you would see in a, in a good and, and complete strategic transformation of a procurement function. Yeah, those, um, there's a, a lot to unpack there and, and not a great deal of time. So I would definitely encourage anybody, like we, we talked about offline and you mentioned that I did a couple of episodes on the flywheel, uh, one of the concepts uh, of then how to put that into practice to kind of create that demand for um for the products and you can do that externally i talked about it internally from a procurement perspective but um it really is a, a fantastic blueprint for driving change um and for driving change in the procurement function you know a couple of things to um to focus on there is um you know that brutal truth that self-awareness i think is something that often gets missed um you know you look yeah. at um i see transformation programs sometimes and they're built on this notion of what best in class is. And best in class, uh, two things. One, a notion of why best in class is, and two, where uh, a company or an organization is right now on that journey. And oftentimes, best in class, you know, at least um, from our perspective, there's really no such thing because it really depends on what the needs of the business are. Um, and it's hard to go and say, these, these are the best 10 practices, we should strive for that, where naturally they may not be, um, needed and may not be um, just based on your situation, you know, or metrics that you try and strive for that really aren't necessarily metrics that you need to be going for. Um, and then figuring out where you are on that journey. And I tend to feel like we overestimate oftentimes our relationship with stakeholders um, without truly knowing what the situation is. Yeah, I, I, I would definitely agree. Maybe, maybe one point to add, which um, is, is not, is not mentioned in in that context that uh, when when Collins published published his work, but um, I I see the the similarities. He's he's talking about at, at the end of this process or as a support of this process um, to use technology as an accelerator, mm-hmm. which makes a lot of sense. And and again, there, there could be many examples. What I see nowadays. Uh, way too often is uh, the hype around uh, digitalization uh, and and often you get the impression and it's even even phrased like that that doing so is already a strategic transformation right. of, of course it's not and and nothing is changing through that it, uh, the only thing which which the digital transformation does is setting setting basically new preconditions of, of doing business because we all know we are we are living in a digital and, and no longer in an analog world but but it's 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 not the decisive factor it is if done well unfortunately not, not too often done well but if done well it can be an accelerator but it's a support and it's not the beginning or, or the most important thing of that transformation and and that to me loops back to the to the first point which which we had a few minutes ago it starts with visionary Mm -hmm. passionate leadership that's the decisive factor without that you will not achieve a transformation in an organization whether it's within a function or whether it's on a larger scale with within a company well, Jürgen, unfortunately, I know it's about time for us to wrap up because I'm sure that we could dig into some of these topics in a lot more detail. Um, but just kind of to leave things, I have one final question that uh, I always ask. Um, and that is, if uh, listeners today have enjoyed our conversation, they'd like to reach out, connect, engage with you, um, where would be the best place for them to find you? Yeah, I would. I would love to uh, to get some feedback in, in many ways to what we have been discussing. Uh, the best way would be either through LinkedIn. Uh, so you find myself there under Jürgen Scherer. Um, although 
um, normally written with an with an umlaut with a U and mm-hmm. two dots on it. Uh, the way I'm spelled in LinkedIn is with a U E, and uh, the other option would be on my on my website, uh, which is www.bxb-exchange.com. So bxb hyphen exchange.com um you can get in touch with me there Perfect. as well all right you can well, what i'll do is i'll include links to both your website and to your linkedin profile on our show notes um page on art of procurement.com just go to art of procurement.com slash podcast for any listeners who are listening in today want to look for that and then just search for the interview that i have here with jürgen shira so Jürgen, I want to thank you um, one last time as we wrap up for joining me today for the insights that you shared. And there's, there's so much to kind of um, take away from this conversation um, in terms of how we really create a function that ultimately has a value proposition which compels people to take action. And that's really what we're all about is um, people wanting to engage with procurement because the value we create versus showing up with a policy and saying, hey, we're procurement. This is how you work with us. So um, thank you again so much. 